It's great to be here today. I want to spend a little bit of time giving you some context about what we're trying to do in, in Watson Health. It's really about the transformation of IBM, a 106-year-old company, as well as the transformation of such a critical industry. It may surprise you, especially after hearing the last speaker, that even though I'm the, the technology person here, many of my slides are going to have pictures of people. It's been an interesting cultural transformation as well at IBM. Um, you know, the, the motto of our company for many, many years, and it's, it's on the walls of some of our buildings and on notebooks and, and things that they give to us, but it's think. Right? We've always been a very cerebral, left brain company. And the thing about getting into healthcare is it's really about the heart, right? It's about the mission. It's a very mission-driven, purpose-driven, people-intensive industry. I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to be here with, with this group as well. Uh, one of the things we do in Watson Health is we have a book club. And earlier this year, the book we read was When Breath Becomes Air by your colleague Paul Kalanithi, his memoir, which was incredibly moving. Um, he's just an amazing writer. Just some of his descriptions were, were just beautiful. But what fascinated me even more was just the deep appreciation I gained for the diversity and the complexity of all the things that you do in your field. I mean, just the amount of, of education and training and then the specialties and subspecialties, it's unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I just am in awe. I, I have so much respect for it. I, I could never have even become a doctor because I'm very much about getting my sleep and, and would never have survived. So, you know, finding a way that we can leverage the expertise and the compassion and the empathy and the things that you are all so good at with technology together is really how health is going to be transformed. Because I think what you do is very complex and it's really hard, right? If we think about what's going on in the world around us, this huge increase in chronic diseases, right? So even if you aren't treating a patient for a chronic disease, the odds are increasingly higher that they've got multiple comorbidities when they come in to see you. And that's going to make the work that you have to do to solve their you know, spine problem, brain problem, et cetera, much, much more difficult. And then we think about things like payment models, right? I mean, chaos and confusion, bundled payments, affordable care, what, what's going on, what's going to happen? You know, we're really at an economic crisis at this point. And then there's digitization and consumerization. All right, so I was thinking about this a bit too, right? What, what happens if somebody has back pain? Now, I'm a, a runner and a triathlete, which you could probably tell by the silly gadget I'm wearing on my wrist. And uh, this past spring, I was having trouble running as many miles as I wanted. I was getting some sciatica. You know, I literally had pain in my butt. And uh, you know, so what do you do, right? Dr. Google. So I went out on the internet and, of course, decided that it, it must be my piriformis. I have a pain in my piriformis. I spent four months doing exercises, right, the pigeon pose and sitting on a lacrosse ball, self-massage, all these things, and wasn't getting better. So when the internet doesn't work, what's the next step we go to, right? Friends and family. So I talked to my friend Kristen at the pool. She's a fellow triathlete, and she had a bad piriformis last year. So she highly recommended a doctor. We'll call him Dr. S. And I went to see him. And I said, I need you to do for my piriformis what you did for Kristen's. You know, I need to be running more. And fortunately, Dr. S is a brilliant diagnostician. Within about 60 seconds after he had me try to touch my toes a couple times, do a couple cobra poses on the table, and then try to touch my toes again, he said, it's not your piriformis. You have a weak core. Your disc is bulging out, and it's tickling the nerve, and that's why you have sciatica. Oh, I guess that makes sense. You know, now as I step back and think about it, I've been traveling every week. I've been sitting. I, yeah, I've been running, but I haven't really been doing a lot of the other things I ought to be doing. Gosh, why didn't I figure this out sooner, right? How typical is this? This is what we do. How, how do people find their way to you? How do people know how to get from that internet to the friends and family into the right place in the health system? I got lucky, right? I found somebody who could diagnose me, and all I had to do was 
start doing some planks, pretty simple. But what if it was more complex? How would I find my way to a specialist like you? And how can we leverage all the data that's out there to help people have that patient journey much more effectively? And how do we leverage that data to help you when that patient comes in to see you? What is it that you wish you knew when somebody walked through the door? Because God knows there's a lot of data out there, right? Pages and pages of longitudinal patient records, which you may or may not get to see when they come to see you, may or may not be summarized. All kinds of information, all kinds of decisions that need to be made, image data that may or may not have been effectively read. Clinical trials, 230,000 active clinical trials at a time. How can anyone wrap their head around it? Has anyone in this room ever tried to read actually the inclusion and exclusion criteria of a clinical trial on clinicaltrials.gov? It's crazy. I actually have. I I did it a couple of years ago, and it's crazy. And we're not getting any better about leveraging all these data yet in terms of speeding up the ability to match patients to trials and about getting drugs to market to the patients that need them. Patients don't even know that a lot of this stuff exists. We have to do better. So in Watson Health, you know, we really believe the time has come to be able to leverage these data and the technologies to transform the industry. We really think it's going to happen between the economic crisis, the consumerization, the digitization. But we also know we can't do it alone. Now, I told you we're a very mission-driven organization. And one of the things we did when we launched the business was to sit down and, and come up with a vision statement and associated metrics. And again, it's all about people. We aspire to serve as a catalyst to improve lives and give hope by delivering innovation to address the world's most pressing health challenges through data and cognitive insights. We're not going to be able to do it alone. We need to be a catalyst. And there are really three factors I'm going to talk to you about that are going to cause this to happen. Cognitive, cloud, and collaboration. So let's talk about cognitive and technology's evolution. IBM is 106 years old. And when we first started out, the early era of computing was really about counting. Computers were used for things like the census. Right? We call that the tabulating era. We moved on from that to you know, the first moonshot era, if any of you saw Hidden Figures, but the programmable systems era in which many of us grew up. And those of us who studied computer science a little bit learned structured programming languages. We dealt with fixed data structures and logic and algorithms and if-then-else statements. It was very nice and neat. But we're not in that world anymore, right? 80% of the world's data that's being created so, so quickly is unstructured. And so we've now entered a new era, which we call the cognitive era. And we like to think that that era was born in, in February of 2011 when the computer Watson played on the TV show Jeopardy. Now, that was the culmination of many years of work and research. And I'm going to be honest and tell you, we didn't go in there with a grand business plan for how we were going to transform industries with cognitive computing. It was really a grand challenge, because in the innovation culture at IBM, we believe in trying to set out these big, hairy, auspicious goals, like beating the world's chess champion, as we did 20 years ago with Deep Blue. And the idea was we had really interesting research in natural language processing, the ability to consume vast quantities of information, both structured and unstructured, and question and answer, right? Trying to connect the dots and find patterns in all of that data. And so Jeopardy seemed like a fascinating way to try to apply those technologies. And that first Jeopardy system was a very custom system. It was custom hardware, custom software, you know, very purpose-built. It was trained on a corpus of knowledge, you know, things that you can imagine if a person were going to play the game. Probably read People magazine and the New York Times and, you know, history books and, you know, sort of elementary and high school curricula, geography, etc., to really learn how to play the game. And if you watched the show, you saw it made some pretty embarrassing mistakes, but 
in the end, it proved that the technology really could remember and appropriately connect the dots. So in 2011, after the television show aired, the phone started to ring. People from a variety of industries were calling because they'd watched the show and they realized the potential opportunity that this technology could bring if it were applied to their industry. And one of the first places we got engaged was with Memorial Sloan Kettering, thinking about oncology. And, you know, I wish I could tell you that Watson was a beautiful magic box and you can just feed data in and, and amazing insights come out, but that's not how it works. It's not easy, and you guys know that, because to become an oncologist or any kind of doctor takes so many years of education, right? Four years of undergrad, four years of med school, you know, internship, residency, fellowship, and then you specialize, right? Even within oncology, you're going to specialize into a certain kinds of cancer. And so we started working with MSK, and we started then working with others in these solutions. And I'll just share one, one story about the progress in cancer, just to make an analogy of how far we got in a five-year period or so. But uh, in the late 2000s, my cousin Ted had melanoma. He had actually been diagnosed at the age of 30 and was treated and got better and was fine for about seven years, and then it came back with a vengeance. And he tried every kind of advanced treatment you could imagine, and he rallied so many people around him. He, he had a PhD in microbiology and worked at a startup um, in Durham, North Carolina, focused on COPD, and he had brilliant friends. And he rallied us around to run races to fundraise for research grants and all of that. And we got to the point by about 2010 where all the treatments had, had just run out. Nothing was working. And because Ted was who he was and, and had the resources available to him, he actually convened a group of experts to help him. He used Facebook as a starting point to build a group and then collected a bunch of people into his living room and read clinicaltrials.gov and all kinds of information from different academic centers that were doing clinical trials in melanoma. And together with his brilliant friends, he crowdsourced a clinical trial. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, wow, how lucky is Ted? Like, who else in the world would be able to do this, right? Who would have access to these resources and this level of brain power that could be brought together to be able to do this? And so they found a trial and recommended it, and, and he went into it, and it worked for a while, and then it stopped working, and, and he died in 2011, which was, was just awful. But the Watson technology that was shown to the world in 2011 has been used since then, and today, if you're a breast cancer patient and you go to the Mayo Clinic, Every single person going through there with breast cancer is screened for potential participation in a clinical trial. It's a tiny start. I think this should be available to everyone, and we will get it there. But isn't that how the world should work? This, this is just one example of the possibilities of cognitive technologies, because people are not going to get into trials if we don't have technologies to make it possible. So when we talk about technology, what do we mean? What is cognitive? It's not just these black box neural network models that you may be reading about when people talk about deep learning, but it's really a core set of technologies that can ingest data, structured and unstructured, develop context, make connections, find hidden patterns in the data, generate hypotheses and update them based on evidence. And the scale that this can be done is just immense. It's faster, deeper, broader than, than a human can. Watson can read things, and Watson's not going to forget. However, it's not going to replace humans. It's going to augment and enhance what humans can do. Because exactly as Jeff was saying earlier, empathy, emotion, that personal connection, that's required. We can't do this with just technology. It requires a deep partnership, and what we need to do is transform the technology so that it's not a barrier to the ability for a physician to interact with their patient, but that it enhances the experience, that it provides a shared conversation about options. Imagine today 
an oncologist using our Watson for Oncology solution, which reads in the longitudinal patient record and all the information about this woman with breast cancer and makes recommendations about evidence-based treatment options and potentially clinical trials, facilitates a conversation between that patient and the oncologist looking at the screen that shows the options. And then maybe the conversation leads into a discussion about side effects of these different options. And the woman says, you know, my daughter's getting married in three months, and I don't want my hair to fall out. I don't want to have to wear a wig to my daughter's wedding. Let's together choose a treatment path that not only is going to lead to a good outcome, but also is going to mitigate the side effects. That's how we have to structure these partnerships between people and technology. So I said the second factor, besides cognitive, was cloud. And why does cloud matter? Well, it's about scale, scale and access. So that first Watson system was a very purpose-built, special-built computer, customized hardware, customized software. We very quickly learned in those early years that if you're going to build a custom, purpose-built, huge system for every single use case in every single industry, it's going to be very expensive, and you're probably not going to sell a lot of them. So we realized we needed to go to the cloud, and we needed training material. So what we've done since we lost, launched Watson Health two and a half years ago is to develop a purpose-built, industry-specific cloud with a huge repository of data, one of the largest repositories of health data, claims data, and other kinds of data in the world. It's HIPAA-enabled, it's GXP-enabled, so life sciences companies can come in and, and build things that are medical devices on it. We made some acquisitions, uh, Truven Health Analytics, which brought us access to 200 million lives worth of claims data, Explorus and Fitel, which generated over 100 million lives worth of patient data, Merge Healthcare, you know, vendor neutral archive, and billions of images. And then we have access to you know, PubMed and Medline and patent databases and all kinds of other data, including things that we talk about as exogenous data that sometimes affect health, things like the weather, because we bought the weather company. And, and it actually turns out that the weather can have an effect on, on your health in some cases. And so this is all put together in a cloud platform with tools and technologies, because we took that original Watson system and we actually decomposed it into building blocks. You know, think about a Lego structure that gets taken apart into pieces. And now we can use those pieces to put things together and build new solutions. And this is really where the third C comes in, the collaboration, because you guys know healthcare is so big and complex that one company is not gonna transform it alone. It really requires building and enabling an ecosystem and so the way to do that is, is to make the combination of the data sources and the technologies available to be rebuilt into solutions. And that's what we're doing. This is where the collaboration piece comes in. So one of the use cases, uh, yeah, radiology is a, a tough field. Right? I'm told that radiologists uh, don't enjoy their job very often because they sit in a dark room all day with lots of images scanning by oftentimes using software that they didn't get to pick themselves, right, because it's because it'd still be tied to the machine that was used to take the image. So we had been doing work in IBM research for about 10 years on image analytics, uh, specifically focused on cardiac and breast imaging at two of our global research centers. And we realized that if we wanted to help build solutions that would make a radiologist's job easier, provide them more context, and help and insight into where they should be looking. Again, we weren't going to do it by ourselves. So we had technology and we had access to some data, but we really needed more. And what we've done is set up what we call the Medical Imaging Collaborative. It's up to 31 participants now, combination of academic research centers as well as industry participants, because what we need are people that have access to data, people that really understand imaging relative to certain parts of the body and where the solutions can be most valuable. And we also need a channel and a route to market because all the technology in the world isn't going to be useful if it doesn't get injected into the workflow. So we've got companies like Hologic and McKesson that are part of this, even though they also compete with Merge, the company we bought. It doesn't matter. We, we want to create an ecosystem. And within this group of 31, they're working together in small groups to build solutions that can bring in analysis of the image, 
plus analysis of information from the patient record to hopefully provide the radiologist with a lot more context, where to look, what to do, what recommendations to make. In another area, closer to where, where you guys work, um, drug discovery, drug repurposing, Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of discussion about alpha synuclein playing a role in Parkinson's. And, you know, a lot of drugs have been discovered already. There's a lot of information out there. There's incredible patent databases and publications and so forth. There's a lot of information to crawl through. And this particular group at the University of Toronto was interested in, in looking at candidates for drugs to potentially figure out where they could target their research. And yeah, they could have sent you know, a lot of research associates off to read papers and study for weeks and months. But instead, they used our Watson for Drug Discovery solution to crawl through and make recommendations. And we generated hypotheses about potential candidates which have surfaced some very likely candidates that they're now researching in the labs and showing a lot of promise. So again, something that computers can do better than people, but they can help people be more effective and eventually lead to a solution much faster than if they'd done it by traditional means. Diabetes, gosh, this is a great data-driven disease, right? A lot simpler probably than a lot of the things that you deal with. But we've been partnered with Medtronic working on several solutions one of them takes data from insulin pumps and glucose monitors and provides personalized insights and recommendations, including predictive capability. Uh, this part's not yet in market, but will be next year, around uh, potential for hypoglycemic episodes in the next three to four hours, which is critically important, especially for type 1 patients who are really scared when they go to sleep at night because they don't know what's going to happen. And if they're not continuously monitoring their blood sugar, you know, they could go hypo and end up in a coma and in the hospital. We built another solution that uh, I was thinking about earlier during, during one of the previous talks where we uh, worked with a patient population in South Texas, um, many non-English speaking, you know, primarily Spanish, uh, uninsured, very unhealthy. Many of them didn't have access to care, so they were an unfunded population that were being treated through this hospital center, and we built a cognitive coaching solution to engage with them. And it's really interesting because in a three-month pilot, their A1C, you know, this is the average glucose measure that, that's typically studied in, in diabetes, it went down by two points, which is huge, huge. And 83% of them saw improvements. And a year later, when the pilot had been over for more than six months, they were all still doing better. And it's really interesting to think about, well, why was that, right? Because part of it was just putting data in front of them about how they were doing. But part of it was coaching. And it really made me wonder how much of it is that personal, that human interaction, because is this a population of people that felt like nobody really ever cared about them before? Nobody cared about their health? And because we found a way to engage them, between the people and an app, and just the fact that someone was communicating with them about their help and educating them a little bit made a huge difference in their lives. So how do we do more of that? Again, it's a combination, I think, of, of technology and people. So I'll conclude by saying our strategy, our mission, our moonshot, we talk about empowering heroes. You're all the heroes out here. I mean, the work that you do, those, those stories that Dr. Cohen shared earlier, I mean, just amazing. You're saving lives. We want to help you do that better. We want to empower you. We want to enable you. I really hope we can find works, ways to work together to transform health. Thank you.